What's up? I'm just popping in to say I'm starting this behemoth. I don't know if this is going to turn into a reading vlog. We'll see how things go. But I'm only halfway through chapter one, so I've read the prologue and half of chapter one through audiobook. And it's quite the experience. And you know what? I'm loving this format. So we're just having some struggles between the Lethiri and the Tissy Eater still. And you know who's back? My girl Saren Pedic, Silchus Ruin, Kettle, Udenos. I'm living. I'm living. I'm living for this. I'm loving it. Okay, so I just finished chapter one. The parts with Tehol and Bug at the end again, I'm just like, I'm so glad that you guys are back. I missed your banter in the last book so much. I guess a bit of a taboo subject here is we already have a lot of instances of sexual assault in this book with Kettle and, oh my gosh, what is the guy's name? Tamar? It starts with a T for sure, who was like torturing this woman. So lots of upsetting things, but... I do think that he handles it pretty well for the most part, but either way, I'm really excited to continue on. And so far, the audiobook format is just helping me so dang much. And I'm really looking forward to this read of Reaper's Gale because I have so many characters that I think this book is going to focus on that I really, really love. Okay, I'm still in my work clothes. I just got home, but I need to talk about this book. I just finished chapters two and three today. So we still have so much going on between the Lathiri and the Tisty Eater. And we start out chapter two following my favorite crew, Saren, Silchus Ruin, Kettle, and everybody. And basically Saren is just like, okay, why are you trying to kill Scavendari? He is dead. And Silchus Ruin is like, no, you don't get it. I need my vengeance. And they enter this like tunnel instead of climbing the mountain, I suppose. Then we see the scenes with Tanal and Karos as they're like interrogating the scholar. What is his name? Janeth? Something like that, I think. And I don't know what's going on with that, but it's interesting. But I love the conversation that she was having with Tanal about certainty because that's one of my favorite themes and topics that Erickson discusses. Basically the discussion that those who are filled with certainty are the ones that you can manipulate and use fear to destroy that certainty that they have. But the greatest enemies are the ones that don't have certainty because they are the ones who have questions and they are the skeptical ones. And I'm a skeptic and I question everything. And I don't know why I'm getting excited about this right now, but I love that whole conversation in chapter two between Tanal and Keros, and I'm probably saying everybody's name wrong either way. Okay, then we have some other stuff going on here with Red Mask and the Lethiri. So there's the whole legend about Red Mask and the clan's daughter, and then he tried to get people to rally against the Lethiri from my understanding. So I don't know like who, what race of people he belongs to, but from what I gather, he's against the Lethiri. And he has Kachain Chamau, like sidekicks. Am I crazy? Then we have Atri Prita Bivat, and I need to look up these names so I can see like who's who. You know what, I should grab my book. We are about to find out right now. So Tanal is Karos's personal assistant and they are Lathiri. Janath is the prisoner, yeah. So Bruth and Trana, he is one of the Tisti Eater because that is one of the next people. In chapter three, it says Red Mask in exile who returned. I need help. Then we have the hunted, Saren Pedak, Fear Sengar, Cattle, Udenas, Wither, Silchus Ruin. Being hunted by Rulad, I'm sure. I think this is all that I wanted to focus on, but I'm just very interested in this whole, you guys, this book is so good so far and I'm just thrilled because my experience with Bone Hunters was not good. This is the only thing I care about reading this month. I am reading other things, but I am so focused on enjoying Reaper's Gale and so far, I'm loving it, even though I'm like barely 10% of the way in, maybe. Oh, we can move my bookmark because we just got to chapter four. You're gonna have to edit a lot of this nonsense out, girl. So in two days, we have listened to 92 pages, which is not too bad, um, considering this is 829 pages. I'm not kidding you. These did not have glossaries before, did they? Okay. So let's move on to chapter three, you guys. So we see Nassal. So that's Rulad's concubine, I believe. And she's worried about Rulad with these dreams he's having. And then Rulad, we see Troll. And Rulad 
orders his shorting and sends Benedis away. And I'm still not okay about the situation with the brotherhood relationships right now. I love Charles so much and how much he cares for Roulade. So can't wait to see what happens there. There's some really humorous tail and bug scenes with dead fish in this section. And then at the end of the chapter, we see Shirk again. And Shirk is one of my favorite characters. So she's on her pirate ship. She's not impressed with iron bars and doesn't want anything to do with him and they find a tortured eater corpse so having a fabulous time 10 percent of the way in i think the audiobooks are going to make this a completely different experience this clip is way too long so i need to stop now but i'm loving it i just had to stop mid recording really quick mid recording mid listening to talk about the ublala and shirk jokes that erickson puts in this book just leave that there. It cracks me up. On another note, I realized that Red Mask is not from Lethiri. He's from like the all AWL clan. So that's clarified now. Going to keep listening. Loving it. Don't mind the pajamas. <laughs> so I don't have too much to say about chapters four and five. Basically chapters four, Red Mask just killing everyone with his Kachain Shamel. I hate how the audiobook make me say things differently now because of hearing it. So Red Mask slaughters. And then Udinas and company discover that it is Han and Masag, the Warlock King, after them, and not the Crippled God or Rulad. So that distinction that I was wondering about earlier. Something's going on with Scavendari Blood Eye. To see Eater are dying. Chapter five was a bit more confusing because there was a couple character perspectives that I wasn't too sure what was going on. There's more happening with the Azap house and the prisoner below it. Is it Scavendari? I liked the scene though with Karos and Tanal. Well, I didn't like them torturing the little bug or whatever and the prisoners. But Janeth Agnar talking about the land and the climate change was interesting. I liked that conversation. But I need help because I do not know what's going on with the errant. What is the errant? I guess I will Google it just now. But the errant and the sky keeps, what's happening there? Then we have the scenes with Shadow Throne and Hood. So they make this deal to use Starval Demolane in order to like help with her sisters, Menendor. But what's happening? <laughs> and then we see. Queen Janal and Nassal like teaming up because something about the cripple god and Nassal doesn't want like any part of it. So is Sukul and Kadu and Sheltathalor, is that Men Menendora's sisters? Or I'm confused with this last part of chapter five because they're at the Azath house and Han and Masag is there and like the crippled god is ready to do something with Scavendare and I don't know what. And that whole scene was very confusing to me. I'm not gonna lie, I had no idea what was going on, but we shall press onward to chapter six tomorrow. So my update from Amazon is I finally finished chapter six and seven today. So chapter seven started book two of Reaper's Gale. And I don't have too many significant things that stand out for chapter six other than Red Mask killing lots of Lathiri dying and some encounter with Talk and Red Mask. The chapter started out with Shirk's ship. So I feel like not too much more to say about chapter six, but then chapter seven, book two started. I feel like we're introduced to some new characters again that I'm not quite sure who is who at this point, but I carry them as in Lethras talking about being here in the past with the Jag Hut and they're talking about Amtos, Falek, Karsa, and Samar are back. Thank goodness. Now there's a couple scenes with Bug and I carry them and they're talking about crawl creating the warrens and i'm not too sure what's going on there to be honest so i guess you know read and find out and then we get to the part where the feather witch runs into Han and masag and he wants to team up with her to destroy rulad because he's trying to destroy rulad by taking down his family and talks about benedis dying and at this point rulad knows there's some type of treason going on so obviously he's concerned there this sick messed up relationship with tanal and janeth is still going on being like prisoner and torturing her and now like wanting to free her or whatever. And then of course, Ubala Plung is back and Karsa has arrived in Letharis and Icarium has arrived as well. So what's gonna happen? And then Bug brings Janeth and they talk about her needing healing. So all kinds of things happening in chapter seven and I'm only about 21% of the way through it, but not rushing it and taking my time moving on to chapter eight back another day still in my scrubs after work but recapping on chapter eight i feel like a lot of cool things happen because we see cotillion and shadow throne talking to quick ben 
who the narration for Quick Ben makes him sound a little bit not well. And I don't know, I just thought that added a lot to the way that I perceive his character. There's something going on with the ASAP. Also, Shadow Throne saved Kalam. Was that the end of Bone Hunters? For some reason, I thought he died. Did he not die? We're seeing a lot more climate change with melting ice in this book. And I like, I don't know, I sort of parallels that that represents, but also thinking about the, is it the Jag Hut that froze everything and how that's thawing to like preserve the time period and the memories and everything. So I like everything going on there. We're getting a lot more back and forth again about the Eater and Tisty Andy, how like who's to blame and whose fault it is. And I just always enjoy those conversations because it goes to show how perspective means everything and it's different based on which side you're on. And then Udinas is talking about how the crippled god like chose Ruad. As men endorse Ruin, Silchus Ruin's sister, whose sister is she? Which, where does she belong? I cannot remember for the life of me, but she does not want Silchus Ruin trying to get revenge against Scavendari. And then they get Clip who can like guide them. Don't know what's gonna happen there. I liked all the information we got in chapter eight too about the Tisti Andy ghosts, like having nowhere to go. Their souls couldn't go anywhere because of the ritual feeling. And a lot of talk about like Amtos Felek in this book. When we get to Bivat and Brol in these chapters, I don't know what's going on too much there yet, but every time I say that, I keep reading and then it becomes clear in my head, so I'm not too concerned going forward. But we do have this cool conversation between Tak and Red Mask, where Tak is telling him about the Malazan armies and like the way that they have this army. And he's trying to convince him to not have so much of the clan fighting. So that is most of chapter eight. Chapter nine, I believe I'm about halfway through right now. I am about 26% of the way through the book. So those will let you guys know what stands out from chapter nine once I'm finished. So Saren Pedek is one of my favorite characters. And so she was talking to Fear and they think that Troll is dead. And she's saying he is dead and her thoughts like, and so am I. There's no point in honoring the dead. I have seen too much to believe otherwise. Grieve for lost potential, the end of possibilities, the eternally silent demise of promise. Grieve for that, fear Sengar, and you will understand, finally, how grief is but a mirror held close to one's own face, and every tear springs from the choices we ourselves did not make. When I grieve fear, I cannot even see the bloom of my own breath. What does that tell you? I just love that part so much. So that quote was from chapter 10. This is the epigraph from chapter nine I really wanted to read. I'm gonna paraphrase it a bit because it's kind of long, but I love what it's saying. So everywhere I looked, I saw the signs of war upon the landscape. There the trees had crested the rise, dispatching skirmishes down the slope to challenge the upstart, low growth in the riverbed, which had been dry as bone until the breaking of ice dams high in the mountains, where the savage sun had struck an unexpected ambush, a siege that breached the ancient barricades and unleashed torrents of water upon the lowlands. And here on this tuck of fold of bedrock, the old scars of glaciers were vanishing beneath advancing mosses, creeping and devouring colonies of lichen, which were themselves locked in feuds with kin. Ants flung bridges across cracks in the stone. The air above swirled with winged termites, dying in silence in the serrated jaws of Renazin that swung and ducked as they evaded yet fiercer predators in the sky. In this part, all these wars proclaim the truth of life, of existence itself. Now we must ask ourselves, are we to excuse all we do by citing such ancient and ubiquitous laws? Or can we proclaim freedom of will by defying our natural urge to violence, domination, and slaughter? Such were my thoughts, puerile and cynical, as I stood triumphant over the last man I had slain, his lifeblood a dwindling stream down the length of my sword blade, whilst in my soul there surged such pleasure as to leave me trembling. Man, I love that. I love Steven Erickson's writing so much I can't stand it. It's like bedtime. All you're gonna be able to see is my reflection in the glasses. I'm sorry about that. So I needed to catch you guys up on where I'm at on Malazan. So chapter nine, we've got a lot going on between Menendor and the sisters there. And we have Karsa being sent to kill Rulad, and then we have Icarium being sent to kill Rulad. And then we have a lot with the errant going on in the next couple chapters. We also have a lot with the Feather Witch again, which I'm enjoying those parts, these interactions between the Sita and Feather Witch that begin in chapter nine. Well, that I'm noticing in chapter nine, Nissel gets killed. That was the most of what stood out to me in chapter nine. Then in chapter 10, we get more with Troll and Onrek and Quick Ben. Right now, to be honest, I'm quite confused about where they are and where they're trying to get to, um, but I'm assuming that that will be cleared up 
as I keep reading, because there's lots of talk about Cruel and him creating the Warrens and such, and I don't know if it's relevant to that or not. We're still following Ruin's crew in the mountains, and I'm confused because they keep talking about Troll being dead, but are we seeing like a dead afterlife version of him? Because clearly he has a POV, so he's not dead, and I'm confused by that because he said he was saved by What's-His-Face. Um, in one of the earlier chapters. So they're just thinking he's dead. And Udanas and, and Fear are not getting along. There's lots of fighting and turmoil within the group right now. And they don't want Clip there. Okay, then we see Tok again with Red Mask. And I forgot who Tok is. And it's bringing me back to my moments of Memories of Ice because I just was like, who is this for a minute? But it was, the name starts with an A. So Tok and Red Mask are doing their thing in chapter 10. And then 11, I need to look up who Twilight is, you guys. Maybe I should do that right now. What I liked from chapter 11 was the errant talking about the battling between gods in this book. Uh, I thought that was an interesting conversation and may Owl's help with that. I also liked some of the conversations we had. There was at least one line where they were talking about they didn't know who Bug was and he was like the manservant and they were like, what if it's the other way around? And I just thought that that was funny. Oh, is it Anist Anister? It just came back to me. The name I was trying to think of before with talk. Then we have the scene with the feather witch stabbing the errant's eye and eating it. And then she has Bryce's finger. Yeah, that's just lovely. And then the Sita goes to try to get Samar Dev to heal the feather witch. And she was like, no, she's giving us a bad name. So I don't totally understand what was happening there. Are they trying to like create new warrens with the errant and the feather witch because the thing they did with the tile and her blood. I like the conversations too because everybody has their little ghosts, Karsa, within their swords in this book. So this is what you guys were talking about before in the live show, I think it was with Andy that I did, where we were talking about how Icarium and Carissa have already met and I had totally forgotten that. And then uh, Icarium's remembering how he had met Carissa here before because people were like, who do you think would win in a battle between Icarium and Carissa? And <laughs> I see why they were asking that. And I said Carissa, cause I got a vote for my boy. And Carissa, Carissa better not die. Carsa better not die facing Rulad. Cause it's kind of like facing the crippled God, sort of kind of, since he like has his power and I will be livid. And Handan Mosag, like he just wants revenge at this point. He just wants power. What, what is he doing? Why is he still here? I don't really care about him. And when he's wanting to find Bryce and Bryce is dead, are they like, where are they? Where is Bryce? So Carsa is instructing Ublala to like go get the people, go get his people and bring him here since he's like this war leader now. And he's got this secret and doesn't want Samar to know. So I'm excited to get to chapter 12 tomorrow. Let's see what else is going on. That's all for now, it's time for bed. I don't feel like showing my face right now, but I have to say when I got to the end of book two and the Lathiri and, oh gosh, what's her name? Yentovis. They saw the Malzans coming up the Letheris shore. Oh my God. That was like one of the most epic moments. Just like, oh shit, of the book. Yeah, I'm loving it. So now I am just a little bit here through chapter, what is this? 13. I don't think I have too much more to update for Reaper's Guild right now, other than I really like Beak and I don't remember them from the past. And then, you know, since I started book three, when the Malazans have gotten to the shore, I'm coming to find out that my least favorite part of this book series is the Malazans. I don't like them. It's the least interesting part to me. Maybe it's because they're the most like human normal characters. The narrator in the book does a good job of making them sound really stupid. Everything else in the whole book series to me is a hundred million times more fascinating than the Melzon army and soldiers. I don't care about them at all. So, um, also troll, quick Ben and crew on rack. Where are they? Are they dead? Are they dead? Help me. What's happening? So it's been quite a few days since I've checked in with Reaper's Gale. Right now I'm like 66% of the way through, so I'm almost finished with chapter 18. And I think that I've been able to listen to these chapters with the Malzons a little bit faster to get through some of it because I've really just found out that 
the least favorite part of the books for me and when it tends to go downhill is some of the Malzahn army stuff um, because I find everything else so much more interesting, but I'm still having a good time listening to it. Every time I'm listening, I'm glad I'm listening to it. As far as my enjoyment of the books goes, that's just not something that I tend to love reading about, but other people love the books for that purpose. So like I get why it's there and I get why it's important. And I can see, you know, if you love that aspect of these books, then that makes total sense. It's just kind of where my interest starts to fall. Right now though, we just got to a part where, what is the debt collector's name, is talking to Bug <laughs> and talking about like how him collapsing the economy and how he's taking out loans to pay his interest on his other loans and all these loans. And I just, I don't know, I'm really appreciating these little comedic moments throughout this part. Um, one other thing that I wanted to just mention is how I'm enjoying watching the demise of Rulad's character and the audiobook narrator just does a really good job making him sound as bad as he's doing right now. So I am appreciating that and excited to see what's going down with Akarium and Rulad and Karsa and what's going to happen between the Malazan and the Lathiri and everybody. We've, we're, we've got to be coming to some epic scale type of situations right now because I feel like he always has, a, well, disregarding Bone Hunters, he always has a climax near the end and then we have some things wrapped up and a little bit after like the main epic point of the book. So I feel like it'll be coming sometime soon. I feel like we're definitely at the point of leading up to that now and I'm just excited to see everything come together. So I'm still having a great time listening to it and there's less than 20 hours of the audiobook left now. So it'll be done sometime within this month. <laughs> okay, so it's been a minute, but chapter 24 has been my favorite chapter so far. I just got to it this, I just finished it this morning. So I have the final chapter, no. I think I have, no, the chapter 23, sorry. Chapter 23 has been my favorite. And that's because we're dealing with Menendor and we have a lot of quick Ben and Hedge. We have Ruin and Crew and we're seeing so much going on there with Menendor and is it her sisters that are trying to protect the thinnest from Silchis and trying to kill him. She's not sure if she's gonna kill her son, Rude. And then we have the happenings between Quick Ben and Hedge. I need to know the significance of Quick Ben punching Hedge and telling him he's bleeding. That was obviously like significant because of the way that it was written, but I'm not sure why. And then we have the things shifting gear between Ruin's crew. So they're seeing dragons in Starville Dem Demolane. And now Kettle is more attached to Udinos. Udinos wants to run away. Saren is going to side with Fear Sengar. Silchis just wants to drive out the poison after he awakens Scavendari. And obviously like involving the cripple god. So like so much is going on here. It's so fascinating. Then, okay, so... The scene with Quick Ben and the magic is pretty intense. And Quick Ben and Hedge just like destroy Menendor and Sheltatha. Like, what? Then Su Sukul ends up dying anyways. And Onrak meets Troll at the gate as Ruin's group is exiting. Okay, then the whole scenes with Saren trying. So Fear is going to kill Ruin. And then Clip kills Fear to prevent him from killing Silchis. Wither is like choking Udinas. I don't understand Sher Saren's power and what she does with Wither. Then we have Troll seeing Silchus Ruin and watching Fear die. This battle going on between Clip and Udinas and Troll and Silchus, there's so much happening here. And this is why it's just my favorite chapter so far. Then we have Kalava come back and try to protect her son, Prawl. So Ruin's like, okay, well, I'm not gonna mess with you. And Ruin, kills Kettle, stabs her with Prawl's dagger, Kettle. So then she was like the sacrifice because then the Azoth begins to like grow where she is. I don't, my brain does not comprehend what's happening there, why? So how is this the vengeance against Scavendari? I need to understand. I liked the little bit about the reunion between Udinas with Fear and Troll. So Udinas trying to explain that Fear died a hero's death because basically he had seen that Silchus was going to kill Troll. So he was trying to save his brother, but also at the same time, like I really didn't like fear that much. So 
I have mixed feelings there. I thought it was like a touching moment though. So I'm reading this ch little chapter summary to try to make sense of everything right now. And it says, Kalava tells Onrak that Ruin used the Finnist to power an Azoth seed, which was Kettle, which will grow into an Azath house that will seal the gates and thus rooting the refugium so it does not die. Onrak asks if she was indeed the woman that night in the prison. So Quick Ben and Hedge get the information of this Azath growing and how Shadow Throne and Cotillion now have access to them whenever they want to these gates, including Starvel Demolane. So much happened, friends. It was a lovely chapter, but I feel like I could read it three times and still be trying to figure out exactly what was happening, but we shall move on. That's what my reread will be for, and I can only say I enjoyed my time while I have lots of questions. So I just finished my workout, hence the sweat, but I was listening to this and I had to talk about it before I forget. So chapter 24 now, wow, I need to move my bookmark. We got to all the parts about Tanal and Janeth, and those were like infuriating and very difficult for me to read actually. But when she killed him, I was like, you go girl. I knew that there was going to be some, I'm like trying to flip to my pages why I keep looking down, but I knew there was going to be something that she was planning for revenge, but I wasn't sure like exactly how she was going to do it. And so I was really, really thrilled with that. I don't know, some of the scenes with Tehol and him, being captured and then the scene where Car Karas or however you say his name is trying to like fix the puzzle with the bug and then he blows on it and fixes it and then he's like oh I'm free you're not gonna kill me or drown me or I really think that his still flipping plot is one of my favorite just the downfall of the economy here and then we are getting to the point where Man, I can't find it. Then we're getting to the point where in Lethary, they're about to like surrender to the Malazans. And I'm just like, how are these Malazans about to take over the Lethary Empire? It just doesn't seem right. But I guess that's the thing that I always like about these books is how Stephen Eric Erickson can kind of trick you and make the underdog seem like they're not gonna win. And then they come out on top. Unpopular opinion. I don't really like the Malazans. I couldn't care less about them, so I kind of don't want them to conquer Lothiri. But Karsa is about to fight still, and so we've got a good chunk of the book left. I think about three-ish hours, so hopefully I'll finish today or tomorrow, but every part of this book has been exciting other than some of the soldier stuff, which you guys know that's just not my jam. Doesn't mean it's not good, it's just not my jam specifically. What a great book and great reading experience this has been so far. I wish I could remember every little detail, but this has been one of my favorite books in this series so far. Like it might be House of Chains, Memories of Ice, Reaper's Gale, then Midnight Tides, because this has so much of Midnight Tides. Okay, so I just finished Reaper's Gale and I have so much to talk about because I don't know if I updated since I've been reading chapter 24, which is equally as epic as chapter 23. I thought the end of this book was killer. Like I thought this was my favorite ending to a book so far as far as the amount of stuff that happened and how epic it was. Okay, so we see Bruthen like summon back Bryce Bedict and I didn't know that was gonna happen. And we've obviously got the, the deal going on with him missing his fingers. And then we have the scenes with the rats and <laughs> basically the mobs calling for Tehol to be released. And I just don't know if I like the picture of all of the rats coming in, but that was going on. Feather Witch is obviously getting upset that she can't control Bryce anymore. And Hannon Masag is still over here thinking he's gonna rule the eater. So they kill Hannon Masag. In the midst of all this, we have a couple scenes with the Malazans and Hellion specifically. I like Hellion, but that's about it, I can't lie, I just don't really care for those parts. And what is going on with Icarium in this machine? I know I should know, but I don't know what's going on with that. But I'm still at this point, I just feel so bad for him not having his memories and feeling like he's constantly being used. And he blows everything up. <laughs> and lots of people die. Then we have the meetup of Rulad and Karsa, which is what we've been waiting for this entire time. Meanwhile, Bryce is killing Karas 
to save Tejo. I really liked like the jumping back and forth of scenes in this. So then we have Karsa cutting off Rulad's arm and then Samar Dev for the win comes in and releases all these spirits. And he's like swallowed by all the spirits. I don't, where does he go? He disappears? I don't understand the Kurakan part where they're like using the knife that's in Karsa's leg to open a door to like with a sacrifice. I am mildly confused how that all went down, but it was cool to listen to. And then Karsa ends up on the beach of the crippled god. And then we have some cool scenes with Fiddler, I think, and Quick Ben and Hedge fighting Silchus Ruin and wounding him and making him retreat. And that's what I mean by like some of the times when like I did not expect them to be stronger than Silchus Ruin and I thought he could defeat them like easily. I don't know why. What is this romance going on between Saren and Troll? Unsure about how I feel about that. So the Lathiri surrender to Tavor. Why did I not expect the Malazans to win? Did anybody else? Am I alone? Am I the only one? And they meet up with, with Tehul and Bryce. Tehul as the new emperor. But the Malazans don't plan to stay. Then it got like a little confusing. So Troll is back with Ruad. And they're having this like brother to brother moment where he wants to forgive him. But then Troll gets stabbed in the back and dies. So meanwhile, Karsa is with the crippled god and Rulad's spirit is there while he's like laying dead in this arena and the crippled god wants Rulad to take the sword and then Karsa decapitates him, cuts his head right off. Yeah, I liked that. That was a good time. Now the crippled god wants Karsa to take the sword and be his little bitch. And Karsa's like, you don't tell me. I choose for myself. No one chooses me. I am the only one who can make choices for myself. You tell him, sir. You tell him what's up. I love Karsa. And then we end with Withel telling Karsa that they will destroy the sword now. And he was like, did you make this? You better not make another one. And then the crippled god is sad that the sword is being destroyed. I think that the relationship between Onrak and Troll was really surprising. Like I didn't think that was going to be a significant part. So that was like one of the really um, touching, sad moments, I suppose. Some of the things that were like over the top gross and disturbing in this book. Some of the sexual scenes as well that I was just like, what is happening? And some of the things that were just frankly hard to read with Janeth and her whole situation. Is Icarium trying to create Warrens because he keeps talking about what Kroll did? And that's like all I can keep in mind with his story is he's saying like, it was mentioned in the last book too with Kroll, what Kroll did and now this book. So. I'm trying to understand what's happening there and what Icarium's whole point is right now. I don't want to forget to mention Beak because Beak was such a sweet part of this story that you couldn't help but love. And the sacrifice and the sadness, I think these are the times when in the midst of everything, he just really hits you with having these compassionate moments where you feel so much sadness for certain characters. So these are all my fresh thoughts as I finish the book. Oh, I didn't talk about the epilogue. I don't understand what's happening with Namander and Clip. So I guess we'll see in the next book. Is Saren pregnant? Because she's needed and she's touching her stomach. So something's happening there. So maybe I will try to come back with some more cohesive thoughts to summarize this. But these are my initial thoughts as of reading the book. Mind blown, a lot of confusion, a lot of epic scale moments, and a wonderful time reading. I think probably like a 4.75 or 4.5 out of 5. Great reading experience. I really enjoyed this book. I will be the first to admit when things go over my head and there's so much that happened that did just that. And you know, that's why I need to reread it again in the future because I can't catch everything, but that's okay. And what I did catch and gather from this book was an excellent time. So in case I don't wrap this up more later, thank you guys for watching. Hopefully you still enjoy these reading vlog style live reactions to the Malazan books. I'm just kind of doing what feels right for each book. So let's talk about it more in the comments. Let's talk about everything I missed. Tell me your favorite part, what was most impactful to you during this and what did I miss most importantly? Because I can always count on you guys to let me know what I missed and help me out for the future books. Thank you guys for watching. I will see you next time. Mm -hmm.